Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romaine Bostic, Taylor Riggs, Gina Martin-Adams in for Caroline Hyde, counting you down to the closing bell on this Tuesday afternoon. Here to help take us beyond the bell, it's our global simulcast. Tim Senevic is here. Carol Masser has the day off for some reason, but don't worry. Katie Greifeld, or at least the head of Katie Greifeld, is here to help She's really walk here. us through the market <laughs> really close. Here. Yeah. We welcome in our audiences across Bloomberg <laughs> Television, Radio, and YouTube. Uh, guys, this is an amazing day here. Yeah. But we should point out, what was it, last Wednesday, we had a, an amazing update. And of course, we saw that get uh, pulled back pretty quickly the following. Yeah, well, that's the question, Roman. I mean, some buying into the close here. But as you mentioned an hour ago, we've seen we've seen surges like this, right? We've seen uh, buying like this in the last few months. And the question is, does it stick or, or do we get new lows like we did yesterday? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really hard to have conviction behind any one day. It feels like the narrative shifts so fluidly these days. But I will point that you did see volume edge lower today, at least for the S&P 500. Yes. I guess that makes sense as we head into Fed Day. Probably everyone has placed their bets. The other thing that I would highlight is that earnings estimate revision has actually suddenly turned positive. This is something oh. I was exploring earlier this week is we, for six straight weeks throughout earnings season, when the market was in the worst of the worst condition, we saw earnings estimates continuously going lower. That suddenly shifted over the course of the last couple of weeks. Something's going on in the earnings estimates that's provided a degree of solace, and I think that could be the catalyst to watch as we march our way toward that next event, which is earnings season after the Fed. We, before we get to earnings season, I know, Romain, we're counting you down to tomorrow. We think about some of the catalysts for this market. A lot has been said about what sort of clarity, guidance the chairman can provide tomorrow with their full steam ahead with 25, but sort of signaling maybe like a yeah. smooth path forward. How do you think that the market can respond to perhaps maybe some more clarity that this market needs? And it'll be interesting to see a sort of what happens in the hours prior uh, to that meeting, whether you see the same enthusiasm tomorrow morning that you're seeing right now. The Dow Jones Industrial Average going to finish the day higher by about 600 points, up about 1.8%. The S&P higher by about 89, uh, call it 90 points here. We're going to round up, up about 2.1%, 2.2% on the day. The Nasdaq Composite going to finish the day higher by about 2. And we talk about the Russell 2000 and whether some of those small cap cyclical names still were getting any love. They got a little love today, up about 1.4% here on the day. A relative laggard, but still a pretty strong day, guys. Yeah, it's really interesting, especially the strength in the later part of the day and how sentiment shifted from the morning uh, into the afternoon uh, when it comes to the equity session. Uh, I got to tell you, a handful of companies in the S&P 500 uh, and in the U.S. indices uh, hit 52-week lows today, but a lot of those actually ended up closing in positive territory, like mm -hmm. Allbirds, uh, you know, uh, Virgin Galactic, and more, Beyond Meat uh, as another example, just to give you an idea of the change in sentiment that we saw later in the day. Yeah, and some of maybe those technical factors, Tim, that's really smart to point out as we move back to perhaps maybe some of the fundamentals as well. For our radio audiences, we do the sector winners and the sector losers. Two steps down really here to get a more uh, perhaps maybe informative view. And we talked a lot about being, the NASDAQ being the big outperformer technology. Katie, that really was the tone here, right? Semiconductors, auto, hardware, software services, those are up anywhere from three to almost 5% on the day. You come down, there's only one sector in the red. A lot of the losers actually still managed to post some green. The one energy, of course, continues to be well, the energy sectors. We think about this rotation perhaps on a second day out of energy. Well, Taylor, you mentioned that semiconductors, they were right up at the top. I'm going to kick off with advanced micro devices, AMD, because we really saw that broad rally in chip makers today. AMD led the way. Shares closed almost 7% higher. Biggest jump in a month comes after three straight days of losses. We also saw a big rally in the airlines, of course. That's uh, after United, just one of several car carriers, rather, that cut capacity forecasts for the first quarter. That helped United close uh, about 9% higher. And I got to talk about AMC because we did get yes. some M&A the, the news. Uh, AMC CEO Adam Aaron tweeted this morning that AMC, a theater chain, yeah. it's buying a 22% stake in Highcroft Mining, not the most intuitive combo, but yeah. I mean, you saw AMC it's shares close intuitive. six points. You, I would love to <laughs> oh, hear, let's hear it, Robert. your case well, for uh, that. How did Highcroft Mining do? Because at one point they, they basically doubled on the day, right? 
They did. And I mean, you did see a lot of those gains come out of the stock. I'm looking right yeah. now. They closed up 9%. They, anytime I ask you a question, I already know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, usually, it's welcome to be on the bell, Katie. Yeah. Interesting that AMC almost closed <laughs> higher. Usually you see the acquire yeah. drop on this news. I, I love, you know what I love about uh, Aron's co uh, comment? He actually, in the statement, he basically said, I think it was like the exact quote was like, I know it seems odd that a theater <laughs> chain would actually buy a mining company. And then he goes on to state the reasons Did why. you see the photo? He tweeted, though, he had a great truck alongside him. Yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah. That great <laughs> he made a visit to northern Nevada to uh, to check that out. Um, kind of a challenge to find decliners when uh, more than 88% uh, of stocks in the S&P 500 are actually higher on the day. But uh, we did talk about the decline in oil today and that leading U.S. energy companies lower. ExxonMobil falling today by 5.7%. We also saw Chevron decline, Taylor, by more than 5%. Uh, and then Coupa Software, uh, the procurement and expense management software company, this is an earnings story. The company reporting yesterday after the bell, uh, fell more than, well, close to 20%, more than 19% right now, hit a 52-week low, uh, ha at one point having their worst day ever, falling to levels last seen in 2019, down 80% from its highs in February last year. The company uh, forecast revenue for the first quarter and, that missed and, the and average And just to estimate. put a point on the chart that you had up earlier, Taylor, when yeah. we look at the decliners today, of the top 20 decliners in the S&P 500, 15 of them energy stocks. Energy stocks. Yeah. You know what I love about Tim is he doesn't try to entrap me with his questions. He <laughs> actually <laughs> comes with me with questions and gives me a heads up. You did that at the top of the hour, Tim with the full faith and credit. I'll quickly just take you there as we wrap up where we closed on the day with mostly yields higher. What was interesting is this was a reversal. We had a big move up in yields yesterday. This morning it was seeming that we were unwinding some of that, but something switched, Gina, where then today it was sort of that reflationary, inflationary a narrative that yeah. continued the two year yield. You're still down a basis point, but you're still hovering near some of those 2019 highs at a 185 and you're continuing to climb about one to two basis points on the day, though. Pretty much all of this doesn't matter until we hear from Jay Powell tomorrow 2 p.m. Yeah, and when you look at the internals of the market, there's something suspicious when small caps are not rising faster than large caps on an up leg. I also think tomorrow, yesterday wasn't really consequential. Normally, if you, when you form a bottom, you form a bottom on this big sentiment washout where no stocks are rising anymore. You can't find any winners in the market. Yesterday wasn't, didn't give us that feel. So I think investors are looking at this as, is it just another dead cat bounce within the longer term downtrend? Certainly valuation opportunities have yeah. opened up here, but is it really the end of this sell-off is a huge question, and I don't think anybody has a whole lot of confidence in that idea. Well, well let's push ahead uh, to a few hours from now, uh, about 20 hours uh, before we get uh, the big Fed decision. And I, I am curious, guys. I mean, I mean, everyone knows, or at least everyone assumes, that they're going to raise rates, at least 25 basis points. But there's still some pretty aggressive bets being priced into this market right now. Is that not true, Katie? I mean, I see about 28 basis points t priced for tomorrow. I would have thought <laughs> it would be lower than that. But, I mean, that would be the ultimate shock if they did go ahead with a 50 basis point mm -hmm. hike. That's been all but ruled out. Yeah. What about details, though, when it comes to the Fed's balance sheet? I know this is something that Taylor certainly watches closely. Do you know closely. QE ended last week? I do know. And I think that <laughs> was that on your birthday, celebrate. Taylor, or was it just yes. that we had a birthday cake? It was. We actually ended QE on my birthday because it's like There's such a big something moment. beautifully poetic about that. <laughs> but what does it mean for quantitative tightening? Right. And when the Fed actually starts to sell some of those bonds? That's a good question. Well, and you've talked and Mike McKee has nailed this, Romaine, when QT, we don't have a real definition. Sometimes it's passive roll off. Yeah. Sometimes it's active selling. Now, the Treasury holdings are actually pretty short dated. Yeah. Those could passively roll off. We're doing a great package on this. We'll give a shout out oh, to Aviel okay. doing a package. Okay. The mortgage backed security holdings, those were 30 Aviel, years. Did she just go by her first name? <laughs> well, we don't want to give oh, okay. away maybe. Her oh, well, Gina, what do you, in all seriousness, Gina, what do you think about I mean, what is QT? What is that even yeah. going to constitute? Yeah, I think it's a very good question. Yeah. It's something we've been really nervous about too because is QT just runoff? Is mm -hmm. QT actual active sales? And the runoff in and of itself could be effectively QT this time around because QE was so large and the mm -hmm. Fed has taken such a big share mm -hmm. of overall market assets and it, we don't know. But the, the lack Taylor's of communication point. on this I think is this underlying uh, source of nervousness. Right. And I mean, hopefully we'll get some clarity around that. But to Tiller's point, I mean, it's mostly short dated securities that would be rolling off. I mean, you have some a vocal minority saying that they should be selling the longer dated securities in the portfolio to take some pressure off the yield curve. But I mean, it seems like the Fed thus far, the leadership there is reluctant to do that.
Is no one calling Gina out on the phrase that she used? <laughs> what did I say? Dead cat bounce. Uh, yeah, I, I, Katie, Katie winced a little bit when she said that. Bed. It was a little <laughs> hey, naming it to a dead. How have we not bounce. talked about the Senate passing the possibility of daylight saving time <laughs> becoming permanent? So when does daylight savings time go into effect? Well, it went into effect on March 13th, yeah, but this if this oh. actually, if this bill becomes law in November 2023. I want to know what so. Jerome Powell I've been an hour late to that. that. So it won't feel like it's what, you know, 307. So, so they passed a bill right to this to what, change time? They're going to, how do you do We that? just get time rid of this change time. Time is a construct. So it's, <laughs> it's a construct. It works. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. So Think life, about that for the next 23 hours, guys. So <laughs> that'll do it for our cross-platform coverage for radio, TV, and on YouTube. We are going to be back tomorrow. Exactly. Same time, same place. Happy Fed Day. Can you get, Bloomberg can you get Radio. Katie a bigger chair, please? Yeah, we'll I've get been one asking in here during one. the break. <laughs> this is Bloomberg.